indeed, worship is all about Jesus. His story these weeks has been almost all about the UK, about the king that passed, about the, the queen that passed, the king that was enthroned, Charles III. What grabbed my attention is that many people on social media praised the spirituality, the faith in God of the Queen Elizabeth II. Some also asked the question, yes, he, she had a strong faith, and I can testify to the fact that she was a church lady. The only time I met her, I met her in church. It happened uh, that I was in uh, London, and on a weekday, she went to Westminster Abbey, and uh, from there she left. Well, I had the chance to see her from close, not to really meet her. But some people ask, okay, what kind of God did she have faith in? Was the God of the Queen the same God that was behind the atrocities of uh, colonialism, of exploitation, of uh, killing in genocides some of the natives, some of the indigenous populations, and the same God that was behind slavery? I don't know how informed you are from history, but many of these atrocities were committed in the name of God. A God whom uh, some of those monarchs worshipped. You may also know that uh, atheism, militant atheism, as we know it today, has some of the strongest proponents and proliferators coming from England. I don't know if there is any direct connection between those things, but uh, interestingly, if you look at history, you will see that England is leading when it comes to atheism. In 2009, there was a huge campaign running in England, started from London. The initial plan for them was to run several dozens of uh, buses across England with an inscription. And I have the inscription up there. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. As if, if God exists, then you cannot enjoy your life. See the problem? And <clears throat> that campaign ended up to have, um, I think, 800 plus buses running throughout England, and that campaign inspired some other campaigns in other countries, even in the U.S. But what is very interesting in that inscription is that there is probably, they say, no God. How come probably? Because if it's just probably, what did you demonstrate, really? 
But why do they say probably? There is probably no God. Well, because that's the most you can say with a reasonable mind if you want to be an atheist. Because you cannot state there is no God unless you can rule out all the contraries. Let me explain that. Give me a name, any name of a person. John? Good, John. If I say there is no John in this building, I should know the name of every person in the building, right? But I should also know every corner of this building all at the same time. Because what if, while I'm looking for John in that section of the building, John moves to this section of the building? By the way, we have John in the building. But let me explain how this applies to God's existence. If uh, I am to say there is no God, I should be able to search, to look for Him everywhere on this earth. Well, wait, wait, not on this earth, on this earth, in this universe, all the 125 billions of galaxies. That's a huge task. Problem with that is that while I'm looking in this corner of the universe, he has all the freedom to move into the other corner of the universe. So practically for me to be able to say there's no God, I should be able to know all the corners of the universe, meaning I should be omniscient, and I should be able to know all the corners of the universe at the same time, so I, so I should be there, therefore I should be omnipresent. Now, you tell me, if I'm omniscient and omnipresent, who am I? Am I God? This is why in Psalm 14, verse 1, the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Nobody can say there is no God in reasonable mind. A fool can say in his heart there is no God. The most you can say, if you want to say it, is there's probably. But what does that help? And how come you have to get rid of him in order to be able to enjoy life? That is Pretty presumptuous, isn't it? But you and I, we walk on an earth among people where from right and left, we are being told there is no God or probably no God. Now, if indeed there is no God, then we can walk just the way we want or the way we can, because sometimes you would like to walk in a certain way, but you cannot walk that certain way. If God indeed exists, then there must be a certain way you want to walk, because the God I recognize is a God that makes life enjoyable. He is not a God that takes the joy out from life. So please understand that when we look at our way of walking or walking the talk, walk the talk, we should always keep in mind that we are not serving a God that removes the joy of life and then you walk like this. But you serve a God that created you, and He has plans for you, plans of peace, of shalom, of well-being. And that should fill your heart with joy. In the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul speaks about walking in 
several different ways. He says, walk in the good works God prepared for you in advance. Walk in those good works. Walk in the truth as it is in Jesus. Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Walk in love, we saw last time. And now he says, walk circumspectly or correctly or carefully as wise. Ephesians chapter 5, we are continuing our reading from verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Not as unwise, that's the Greek, but as wise. Lord, we are ask, asking for wisdom from you. May you fill our hearts with wisdom coming from above, in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, see, Paul says, that you walk circumspectly, or carefully, or correctly, not as unwise, but as wise. What is wisdom? You know, wisdom is a biblical term, but it can also be used as a philosophical term. But in the Bible, we have knowledge, we have understanding, and we have wisdom. Are those things the same thing? Look, for instance, in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6. From the Lord, for the Lord gives wisdom, from His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Well, wisdom, knowledge, understanding. What is knowledge? Knowledge is information, is skills that we acquire via education, via experience, training. And it seems that knowledge is somehow the faculty of the mind. You need a good mind to have knowledge. We also have understanding. What is understanding? Well, understanding is more than just knowledge. It is to be able to apply knowledge in a certain context, in a certain situation. Knowledge, even my cell phone can have knowledge. Can you please give me my cell phone? Because I want to show you that Siri has knowledge. Siri? Who is the king of England? Charles III is the monarch of the United Kingdom. Has knowledge. But I can ask questions that Siri cannot answer. Siri, do you have understanding? Hmm, I don't have an answer for that. Is Told there you. else I can help with? <laughs> for understanding, you need more than just knowledge. Knowledge is the what? Understanding is the how. But what is wisdom? Both knowledge and understanding seem to be the faculty of the mind. Interestingly, in the Bible, you will never, well, with one exception, find wisdom in connection to the mind. Wisdom is also always, almost always connected to what? To the heart, correct. And that is interesting. And Paul says, see that you walk circumspectly. And before, in chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, he said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding says the translation, but 
In the Greek, you have cardia. What is cardia? I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened and you will be able to know what is the hope of His calling, what, is the, what are the riches of His glory, of His inheritance in the saints. And one more thing, what is the exceeding greatness of His power according to the working of His mighty power. And if you remember, I translated that using the same word for all the synonyms the exceeding greatness of His power according to the power of the power of His power. That's what Paul says. And I pray, he says, that the eyes of your hearts will be open for that. Yes, because wisdom is a faculty of uh, the heart. According to the Bible, wisdom is in the heart. You want to see a proof for that? Psalm 90, verse 12, for instance. Psalm 90, verse 12 says, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What is wisdom then? Well, wisdom is a sort of soaring above reality and getting the right picture, seeing things that other people cannot really see, seeing things from a divine perspective. And Paul says, you should walk circumspectly, but he starts with the word see. See that you walk circumspectly. Why? And then he goes on, the next verse, verse 16, walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. And uh, if days were evil in Paul's time, it might be that days are even worse today, or as the children will say, eviler. Yeah, they are evil. So you walk circumspectly, as the NIV says, making the most out of every opportunity. But how are you going to redeem? Because the word there is ex agorazo in the Greek, you know. Many have this concept of redemption as being a buying back. Somebody buys you back. Jesus is the Redeemer, and He buys you back. When in fact the meaning of the word is to buy you out. How? Jesus is the Redeemer, and Jesus the Redeemer goes to the slave market. That's the picture in Romans book of Romans. Jesus goes to the slave market, and there a slave master sells slaves, and he goes to the slave master and asks him, what is the price of this slave? And Jesus tells him, okay, that's the price. Take my blood for this slave. In other words, take me. Let him go. Something similar, says the Apostle Paul, we should do with our time. We should redeem our time. How? Well, we cannot really buy our time back. You can buy your car back. Years ago, I bought a car from a dealer. And the dealer told me, if one day you want to sell this car, please call me. I'm going to give you a good price. The time came, I was moving to the United States, and I was selling my car. I called the dealer, asked him what his price would be. And when he told me what the price would be, I said, mm -mm, no. The other day, a friend told me that he bought a car two or three years ago for 11000 And the dealer wants to buy it back for 14000 now. I said, What? What a weird time. But here's the point. You may want to give for your time that is past 
much more than the value you saw in it when you had that time. But you cannot buy your time back. Nevertheless, you can buy your time out. Out from where? Out from slavery. How? Well, Paul says, redeem your time because your days are evil. The truth of the matter is, every morning when you wake up, by the time you wake up, your day is in slavery. Yes, in the slavery of uh, guys, of uh, gangs, of groups, of gigs, of gadgets. This gadget here may qualify for all of them. So when in the morning you wake up, you are in a situation where you have two possibilities. You either go into slavery where your time is already, or you want to buy your time out. Are you with me? Paul says, because the days are evil, we want to buy our time back. Not back, really, because what is gone is gone. No, no. The time that is still there, buy it out from slavery. That's the exact interpretation that Ellen White gives in Christ's object lesson. He sa she says, we are admonished to redeem time, but time squandered can never be recovered. We cannot call back even one moment. Is that true? Yeah? But as she says, the only way in which we can redeem our time is by making the most of that which remains, by, make, by being co-workers with God in His great plan of redemption. And then she continues on page 346, parents, 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 should teach their children the value and right use of time. Teach to them that to do something which will honor God and bless humanity is worth striving for. Even in their early years, they can be missionaries for God. She continues, parents cannot commit a greater sin than to allow their children to have nothing to do. Oh, my Lord, to allow children to have nothing to do. The children soon learn to love what? Idleness, and they grow up shiftless, useless men and women. And what's the result? When they are old enough to earn their living and find employment, they work in a lazy, droning way. I didn't know what droning meant in this context, so I did the dictionary digging, and I understood that droning has two components. Droning is a, a buzzing kind of, uh, just buzzing around kind of work, and it's, it's very slow and slacking. Lazy, droning way, yet, yet, and that's the problem, expect to be paid as much as if they were faithful. Isn't that the world we live in? Haven't you heard, haven't you seen stats in which we are told that the younger generation, my age group and under especially, has such a hard time holding down a job? Yeah, we are there. We are experiencing this. And if you are any kind of uh, entrepreneur, you understand what we are talking about here. So, yes, we need to buy the time out. And then the text goes on. Paul continues, therefore, he says, do not be unwise, but understand and the Greek word there is put together. Put together what the will, what the desire of the Lord is. Put it together. How do you put it together? Well, it's like a puzzle. If you walk carefully, 
and I have the process described there. Maybe, maybe you, you don't even know how to walk carefully. Paul says, if somebody doesn't have wisdom, what should he or she do? Hmm? Pray. Ask God, and God gives freely. He gives generously without even blaming you for anything you've done. So pray for divine wisdom. Then Paul says, walk circumspectly, walk correctly, walk carefully. Okay, I'm walking circumspectly, correctly. Buy your days back. Every day you can buy out your day from the slavery of, of who? Of guys, of groups, of uh, gigs, of gadgets. <laughs> buy, them, buy them back. Buy them out. Look with the eyes of your heart, Paul says. You should be seeing the pieces because God has the pieces there. And when you find the pieces... Start putting them together. Well, this is a puzzle of my son. He's, he has as a stage of life when he's a, a firefighter. And yesterday he put it together, and he was so happy that the firefighter came out. Now, your life is much more complex than that. But... The big picture of your life is a matter of an entire life. Throughout your life, go and seek for those pieces and put the pieces together. That's how you get the full picture. And when you look back, says Ellen White, and see the way God led you throughout history, you would say, I wouldn't change one thing. He did the exact, the right thing. And to me, that's fantastic. Paul continues, and, and he kind of shifts gears a little bit in uh, verse 18, and he says, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation or debauchery or wastefulness, but be filled with the Spirit. Hmm, that's interesting. How, how does this come here? I mean, he's talking about wisdom, about seeing, and then all of a sudden, he speaks about wine and drunkenness. Is there any connection? Of course there is. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 says, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler or rioter or troublemaker, and whoever is led astray by it is not what? What? Wise. Ah, there was a problem in that church in Ephesus, some sort of problem. We saw last time there were some issues around the sexuality, but now Paul moves towards something else, but he, he does it very nicely. He says, be wise, not unwise. Okay, where are you taking us? Proverbs 23, verses 31 and 33, through 33, do not look, do not look, again, look, look, Paul says look, so that you walk circumspectly. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around, a better translation is, it swirls down smoothly. I mean, it goes down easily. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Yeah. Some translations have strange women because of the word usage. Some translators thought that that's the meaning. I think it's, it's more general. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. So let me ask you something, because you may be asking me, Pastor, 
So no alcohol, that's what the Bible teaches. And then I can uh, do a debate, this side against this side. This side, prohibition and total abstinence. This other side, uh, moderational or moderate use. Oh, you can move over there if you don't like that side. So let's debate, and it will never end. Let's be fair to the text. What does the text say? And do not be drunk with wine. Some translations rightly have, do not become, do not get drunk. Which means to some people, well, listen, if I just take a little bit, a little bit, I still have the picture of somebody asking my neighbor out there in the village, just, just a little bit, please, just a little bit. Do not become drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. The problem is dissipation, because somebody that drinks and becomes drunk cannot walk carefully, circumspectly. You may see people walk in zigzags. Somebody that becomes drunk cannot uh, put together the puzzles and they don't see the right things. They see strange things. So how are they supposed to see the puzzle? So then what does the text say? Is it abstinence or moderation? Well, if you only read the first part of the text, it is moderation. Do not become. And I don't want to say anything more, but just show what the text continues saying. The text says, be filled, be filled with the Spirit. Okay? This is a symbol of you, like the bottle. I use this bottle because I didn't want to use a beer bottle or a wine bottle. So this is you as a bottle, and I'm going to use water as a symbol for the Holy Spirit. I can assure you that this thing here is full of water, full of the Holy Spirit. Should I even open this? That's the Holy Spirit in there. Here is the spirit of Bacchus or Dionysus. So if the Holy Spirit fills this up, and I pour some of the spirit of uh, Bacchus here. How does it work? Now, now you, you decide whether it is uh, moderation or abstinence. But the text moves on. It takes it to a new level. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And, and you think, okay, so how, how does this now come here? Well, there is a problem in that church, obviously. And this is the problem, roughly. Some of the people in the church get drunk, either at a party or even at the church. Because in Corinthus, Paul even tells them, hey, don't do that when you get together at the church. Don't drink. I mean, hey... Please, stop that thing. So, so what Paul says is that instead of getting drunk, they should be speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Because this is what happened. When people get drunk, they speak to one another. They even want to sing to one another. I don't know if, you, if you've seen people that are drunk and they grab one another and that's how they speak loudly to one another as if they cannot hear one another and they start even singing to one another off tune. So that's the manifestation. Paul writes this in a letter, smooths it out a little bit, but that's what he says. Hey, speak to one another not the nonsense talk that wine produces, but the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. 
Well, music is like a postal truck, a mail truck. When the mail truck comes, the mail truck enters somebody's uh, psyche, and I use psyche for a combination of mind and heart. I don't want to be scientific, but that's, that's how I take it, okay? So the postal card comes, that's music. The content is unloaded, music goes on. The content stays. Have you ever seen any commercial without music? Not really. Do you know how commercials function? Music starts, the truck comes, right? Then some words are said, and then music goes on, okay? Point is, they know, because this is, this is something uh, that has been proved again and again, it's even scientific, some may say, that uh, music has this capacity of carrying information inside and leaving it there. So that's why it's very important to really know how to pick and choose what you want to listen to. Because some of the things that are transported inside are left there, you don't even know, but one day it affects your life. There is a saying, some people quote it from Plato. Uh, it's not from Plato, it's misquoted from Plato. But this is what it says, let me make the song of a nation and I care not who makes it laws. It can be rewritten like this, let me write the hymns of a church and I care not who writes the theology. Okay, you may say this is exaggeration. But biblically it's not because God spoke to Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 31, write down this song, why? And teach it to the children of Israel, why? Because when uh, time passes, it will not be forgotten. Music can easily make content permanent. And it seems that in the time of uh, Paul, there were three different kind of mail trucks. First, they had psalms. Psalms were psalms from the Old Testament chanted, because psalms are songs, chanted, and they were even accompanied by instruments. Hymns, hymns were a pretty new genre, because it was taken from the Greek culture. In the Greek culture, they used hymns to praise the gods. Now, Christians had Jesus Christ to praise as their own God, and they took Him and they kind of baptized it, and now they were using it in church. And you even have hymns in the Bible, for instance, in John chapter 1, or Philippians chapter 2, or Colossians chapter 1, or Hebrews chapter 1, segments of hymns. Because in those days, hymns, that's what hymns were, Praise songs to Jesus Christ as God. That's a different definition from what we know for hymns today. Today, if you ask what a hymn is, people will say, well, it's a good old song or a song with no drums or a, um, a song from the hymnal. Well, in the hymnal, there are indeed hymns, but there are also psalms. There are also chorales. There are also... Uh, gospel songs, Negro spirituals, even marches. So there are all kind of genres in the hymnal. Plus, they also had what they call spiritual song. Emphasis is spiritual. Spiritual songs. Those three categories. But please notice something. That there are two aspects emphasized. One is singing. And the other one is making melody. And for making melody, this is, this is the picture. I, I need the, the guitar 
because the word for making melody or making music is this strum strum or, or pluck so there's the singing part and there is the music part it's not a good translation in the heart in your heart to the Lord as if it has to happen only in the heart it is from the heart from your heart or with your heart to the Lord how do I know it's not in the heart because if it's just in the heart then it's not speaking to one another so this is speaking to one another that's what Paul says instead of singing those nonsense things that you can sing when you get drunk this is what you should sing to one another and do music to one another well from your heart not to one another really because it's to the Lord there are two components there all the praise goes to Jesus but there is also a horizontal component of worship and that is described better in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 this is what it says the let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing or putting in mind that's the Greek there put in mind one another admonishing one another in psalms hymns spiritual songs singing watch that how with grace in your heart to whom to the Lord but again notice yes it all goes to the Lord but there's communication this way there's teaching there's admonishing which means that it should be understood and also it should be true because it's the word of Christ and I'm speaking here about the content of the lyrics the words sometimes I listen to Christian music and I cringe because of the poor theology that those words convey and when I say that I'm not referring only to the new songs also to the old songs many of the old songs have a problem because they speak about love with no grace in it and some of the new songs have the problem that they speak about love with no truth in it so we have issues so please singers always check the words the lyrics you want to make sure it is a biblical teaching it is the word of Christ that is conveyed so that's the singing part it has to be understood it has to be true but it has to be said with grace in your hearts to the Lord how about then the music part because most often in worship we have lyrics and we have the music and Paul says yes even the making of the melody or the music that is also to the Lord and the picture is the strumming of a, of a string instrument but is that limited to a string instrument does the Bible, the Bible even speak about uh, instruments and what instruments should be played in church of course look at psalm 150 for instance psalm 150 says praise the lord hallelujah praise god in his what's the word sanctuary praise him in his mighty firmament praise him for his mighty acts praise him according to his excellent greatness and then the list starts praise him with the sound of the trumpet the shofar that's the horn of the animal that they used praise him with the lute and the harp both of them are string instruments the navel and the kinor praise him with the timbrel and dance if somebody doesn't know what timbrel is tough in hebrew tambourine drum and dance verse 5 verse 4 second part and then verse 5 praise him with stringed instruments 
flutes or pipes, praise him with loud symbols, praise him with clashing or resounding symbol that can praise God? I don't know, but I'm reading the text as it is in the Bible. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, which is hallelujah. Now, have you seen the piano there? Where? No? Well, the piano is a string instrument. Because you have three categories there. Stringed, blowed, or blown uh, wind instruments, and percussion. The piano is a stringed instrument with percussion. It's a combination. Because if you didn't know, there are some little hammers. Hammers? That hit the chords, the strings. And, oh, that's, that's not a piano. What is this? Did you see the organ there? Pipes. This is a complex instrument of pipe. Well, this is electronic. But the, the organ is a pipe instrument. So practically in that list, you have all three categories. That's, that's what you have. Now, that means that when, when we praise God, when we sing hallelujah, both the words and the music come from the heart. That does not exclude the mind. Don't get me wrong. No, because the Apostle Paul says, I sing with my spirit and I sing with my mind or intelligence. And it seems that both are somehow in the picture. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But what we need to understand is what Paul is going to in the process of that uh, letter is we want to know the will of God. The will of God. And we have, again, the list of uh, what, it hap what it means. Oh, by the way, just, just for uh, the advanced students. That is the chiastic structure of Psalm 150. Just look at it. Don't say a word. And understand what it says. And then, just go back to the context of Paul's teaching. This is what he says. Pray. Pray for divine wisdom. Walk circumspectly. Walk correctly. Buy your days out or back. Look with the eyes of your heart. Of your heart. See the pieces of God's desire. Put those pieces together. Well, you need the right piece to put them together. And then act accordingly. And what he says is, no, drunkenness does not fit the picture. And uh, singing nonsense to one another does not fit the picture. What really fits the picture is singing and making music from the heart to the Lord, but so that people can understand one another. And then he says, in everything, always give thanks. But that's a sermon for thanksgiving in a few weeks from now. See, it just happens that I am now your lead pastor. To me, it is because it's the will of God. To me, it is because uh, almost one quarter century ago, I put it together that God was calling me to ministry. And last year, I put it together that God was calling me to serve here as a lead pastor. 
Some of you may be happy about it. Some of you may be not that happy. But here's the point I want to make. Every single day, and especially when I prepare my sermon, I ask this question, what is the will of God? And sometimes I come across texts that I say, no, this is not like that. This is not how, how I was taught. But if I want to be honest to the one that called me, I have to teach you guys the entire Bible as it is. Amen.